Uh, hello everyone, welcome to uh, Call Up's webinar on deep canvassing. We hope that you join us and you are settled down and uh, that you know we can learn all learn something today. Uh, just as a brief introduction, good morning to one and all. So, in the world of like political persuasion, like deep canvassing is relatively a new technique as such. But uh, don't let that part phase you. There has been a lot of rigorous testing and research, and it has repeatedly been proven that deep canvassing is something that does live up to the hype. Which is quite nice because you know, as we work on so many campaigns and so many like political events, there's often a question about whether something works or not. Are we like just spending money on things that may not have results? But deep canvassing is something that does uh, actually have results, which is why we are so excited to have uh, um, you know have this conversation today. So, in terms of deep canvassing, just basically, we're not looking to bombard voters with like facts and stuff, but we want to have a genuine and open conversation with them. And through like grace and words, we are hoping to like change hearts and minds, basically, and it does work. So that's the exciting part. So to help us learn how exactly it is, we are joined today by LM. Um, Laura Mai Davis has been part of the deep canvassing movement since uh, 2019 and has worked in the past with everyone from like conservationists to like undocumented immigrants. Um, LM currently consults with organizations across uh, America and Canada through LM engagement, uh, which currently provides support in issues like program management or training for staff or canvassers, script development, and even leadership programs. So, you know, so they are quite uh, an expert at telling us that. So without further ado, let us uh, give the main stage to the expert itself. Like, thank you for doing this, Ellen. Thank you so much for that introduction. And yes, good morning to those of us on North American time. So looking forward to sharing some information with you today and having a bit of a conversation as well. I'll present some slides and give you the lowdown. And then I look forward to some Q&A and conversation if I'm able to give some, some insight or support on particular scripts that you might be working on right now. Happy to do that here in this time together. All right, there we have it. My slides are up there, although they're looking a little funky. Let me see if I can make them look better. Aha, ah, there we go, there we go, that's better. All right, so today I'll be sharing specifically best practices for effective deep canvas scripts. I'll start off by sharing a little bit more about my background, why I'm here and delivering this information to you today. And then I'll walk through the basic components of a deep canvas script, explaining what the purpose of each section is. I'll share some examples as well from scripts that I've worked on. I'll address some of the common challenges when it comes to scripts and effective deep canvassing in general. And then we'll have time for some workshopping and Q&A. I did not start out thinking that I was going to be a deep canvasser, or even a community organizer. My career actually began in environmental education and community engagement with environmental and conservation based nonprofits. I happened into the deep canvassing movement in 2019 and really got an excellent opportunity to kind of get in, not on the ground floor because this work had already been going on for some time, but got to train with some of the expert movement leaders, uh, folks from the New Conversation Initiative in California. And from there, I, I moved up into managing several different deep canvas programs in person. And then of course, in 2020, everything went virtual. Over the last couple of years, I really got my, um, uh, got my experience working with the People's Action Network, and they've authored some of the leading uh, reports and experiments on deep canvassing. So when you see the field experiments that have been done and some of the research that's been published from uh, Brockman and Kala, I was a part of those projects, training those teams, leading the script development process, and managing those experiments. Uh, I started my own consulting firm, LM Engagement, in 2022, and really have kind of found this niche in script development, or what I call script iteration. I've also had a lot of uh, a lot of fun working with, particularly environmental organizations, because of my background in environmental science. I kind of have a, a specialty in climate, energy, and conservation-related issues, and I'm a big fan of Call Hub. Uh, I've used many different dialers on different programs, and Call Hub is one of the best. So happy to have this partnership with them. The big picture overview, the kind of top sections that you're going to need in every successful deep canvas script. One, a strong introduction, getting into the conversation. Two, a good initial rating. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Uh, 
Of course, story sharing is the, the heart of the conversation. You may need to address some concerns. So if you're dealing with an issue that has a strong opposition or misinformation around it, there's gonna be an education component. Making the case and then the, the final rating is wrapping it all up. And just kind of one by one going into a bit more detail here. Like I said, the introduction is getting into the conversation. And this is specifically when canvassers are building rapport with the voter or resident or person on the other end of the conversation. The initial rating, so this is the first time you ask your, your zero to 10 scale question. And the purpose of asking that, as well as a couple of follow-up questions, are to really know where the voter stands. Uh, third, as I said, the heart of the conversation is story sharing. That's really where the power of deep canvassing lies. And that's going to look a little different depending on your topic. Of course, each script is unique, but the purpose is to make that emotional connection with the voter. Uh, fourth, like I said, addressing concerns. This is where you're going to want to clarify misinformation and take the opportunity not just to respond and educate, but to try to really shift the narrative. And I'll share some examples of what that might look like. Uh, almost at the end, you want to make your case, and this is where you get to actually uh, kind of preach a little bit. This is where you share the key messages, the big takeaway of your campaign, the things that you can't say in the introduction, but can say later on once you've uh, built that emotional connection and shared with the voter. And then the wrap of the final rating. And this is important because this is where the voter articulates their shift in beliefs, the power of saying, I'm, you know, a six at the beginning and I'm a seven at the end, even if it's an incremental movement, there is a lot of power in having the voter actually say out loud that they have moved. So first, getting into it, getting into the conversation, building rapport, you know, it, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, it's straightforward in theory. <laughs> you know, you, you say who you are, why you're calling, and I always say, be a person you know, make small talk. So that might look like, you know, just simple, how are you doing today? How, how you're doing with this winter weather, this rainy weather, this hot weather, whatever the weather is. And, you know, something that I've found useful in a lot of contexts is asking, a, you know, say, I'm calling today to have an open, con open and honest conversation with our neighbors. But first, what do you like about living here? What do you like living in? What do you like about living in, in Alberta? What do you like about living in, in Logan County, Ohio? You know, lean into the the local sense of pride or identity in whatever community you're calling into. That's the introduction. And like I said, it's simple in theory, but it usually requires some trial and error or what I call iteration to find what works. And of course, you know, training your canvassers and what it means to build rapport will also result in more success. Right after the introduction, you're going to get your initial rating. So this is where you want to ask your zero to 10 scale question to know where the voter stands. And you want to ask the right question. And this can be tricky, especially if you're working on a more complex issue. You want to be specific and direct and concise. So you want to be very clear, but not wordy, not overly long. And a key aspect of this initial rating, like I said, is you want to ask follow up questions to fully understand the voters' values and concerns. What's putting them in the middle? What's making them lean to one side or the other? What's, what's the complexity under there? For an example of an initial rating, uh, here we have uh, an example from a script that I'm working on now. The question is, how much are you in favor of industrial solar here in Logan County? So the question itself is pretty brief. And then of course we have the on a zero to 10 scale where zero is completely opposed, 10 is completely in favor. But the question itself is pretty direct. And then after they give that rating, there's, okay, what are some reasons why you might be in favor? What are some reasons why you might not be in favor? To, to go a little bit deeper with that complexity. For a different example, this was an electoral script. So, uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison over in Minnesota, we asked, you know, how likely are you to vote for Keith Ellison for Attorney General on a zero to 10 scale? But again, after a voter gives that number, you want to ask, why is that the right number for you? What keeps you from saying 10? You know, if someone says eight or nine, you want to know why they're not a 10. Or if someone says a two, okay, well, a two is different from a zero. So you want to really get into that complexity right here in the initial rating. Again, you know, you need to ask the right question, and that will require some, some iteration, especially if the issue is a little more complex. A good way to know if you have an effective first 
uh, effective scale question is if you're getting a variety of initial ratings, if you're getting, you know, some fours, some fives, some nines, some sevens, that's a good sign versus if you're getting like all zeros and tens, probably not asking the right question. And it's very common that folks are not going to give a response right away. So you might have to train your canvassers or include in your script some some gentle assertiveness here, some, you know, if you had to put a number to it or what what based on what you know, what's your gut reaction? Those are phrases that you can use in your script or train your canvassers to use to make sure you're actually getting a clear initial rating from the voters you're talking to. Third, story sharing, the heart of the conversation. So this is where we're practicing our compassionate curiosity, our, our vulnerability to share our own stories and elicit the personal experiences from the voters that underlie their beliefs, their conflicted feelings. Uh, you wanna focus on those lived personal experiences. Of course, the experiences that are relevant to the topic at hand, you know, it's not all over the place. The idea is that this story exchange is specifically structured to elicit the experiences that are relevant to your issue, those emotional experiences that are going to help pull the voter to towards you. So this is going to look uh, pretty different depending on the issue. I've got a couple of examples here uh, from that electoral script for Attorney General Keith Ellison. Um, we had to give a little bit of uh, context as far as what does the attorney general do? Um, because we found that a lot of folks didn't actually know. And so we couldn't dive into that depth without giving a little bit of context. But we used this to provide an example of, you know, something that Keith has done as attorney general is, for example, he's um, really cracked down on slumlords who are taking advantage of renters. And that's personal to me because, you know, my partner and I rent our home and we've had trouble, you know, finding a place that we feel safe in. And so, that's a way to share a personal story that is relevant to the issue at hand. And then you ask the voter, have you or someone you love struggle with, you know, housing or making ends meet, healthcare? We specifically use those prompts because we found that there were examples of stories and personal experiences that folks had related to those issues, as well as actions that Keith Ellison had taken to directly impact those issues. And there's this nice line here in this script that I love. It says, when we talk about politics, it's easy to get caught up in what we see on the news or on social media, but really it's about what people are going through in their everyday lives. And that there is a, a reminder to the canvassers as well as the voters that we're not in fact land. We're not about hypotheticals here. We're talking about our actual lived experiences. A different example in one of my uh, climate focus scripts, uh, we ask folks, when you hear the phrase climate change, what does that bring up for you? And then we share about how, you know, the changing weather, the smoke from wildfires this summer and poor air quality uh, made it hard for people to go outside and for folks, you know, like my own mother who has asthma, she couldn't enjoy the things she used to do like gardening because uh, it was unsafe for her to be outside. and. You know, we ask, have you or someone you care about experienced something like that? And so we're going from this really uh, potentially triggering complex issue of climate change and making it personal and and digestible. You know, it's the everyday experiences you have with with changing weather, with unpredictable weather that bring climate change close to home. And we found a lot of success with this model in various um, sort of climate and conservation and energy related uh, scripts. There's a reminder here to use the cone of curiosity. So again, you know, the script is a tool, the script is a guide, and the way you train your canvassers is going to help them be successful using that tool and using that script. So developing a strong story exchange definitely requires iteration. Uh, you can train canvassers or, or design your script so that the canvasser is sharing their story first as a sort of prompt for the voter to kind of give an example of what you're looking for. And again, you know, success comes from effective canvasser training. Uh, you can follow a script word for word, and that is good. What really drives it home, though, is uh, developing these skills of curiosity and gentle assertiveness in the folks who are having the conversations. After you've gotten into the topic, you've shared your stories and personal experiences, this is where there's some space for 
uh, clarifying this information, addressing concerns. And so this, again, is a pretty variable part of the script. It really depends on the details and unique context of your particular issue. There's likely going to be existing uh, research out there, though, if, it, if you're dealing with climate change or healthcare, immigration, whatever the issue is, there's probably research on messaging best practices. And this is where you can apply that, you know, no need to reinvent the wheel as you're, you know, developing this section and iterating your script. Um, use the resources and research that's out there and see, you know, if folks have had success with this particular framing, put that on in there. Um, there's no need to try to come up with your response to misinformation out of the blue. There are folks working on this <laughs> all the time. Something else that happens in this section, though, getting to the shifting the narrative part, is I usually try to um, guide folks to continue using curiosity at this point to move the conversation forward. You know, even if you have built trust and rapport with a voter, <sighs> re-educating folks or, or trying to get people out of misinformation is really hard. And, and I found that you really can't deep canvas someone out of misinformation. What you can do, though, is continue to use your curiosity to kind of poke at um, whether their experiences actually align with the things that they say they believe. And some examples of what that might look like um, so in, uh, in, in US politics over the last few years, uh, something that comes up a lot is folks say stuff about crime. Oh, well, you know, there's, there's all this crime going on and that's a narrative that has been pushed by, um, you know, the, the political right to sort of distract from uh, real issues. So instead of trying to say, well, actually, da, 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 <laughs> we say, oh, do you feel safe in your own community? How have you been impacted by that? It may be that folks uh, have been impacted by crime. And if that's their experience, we wanna make space for them to share that. More likely than not though, they'll be like, well, you know, the news or well, you know, you see things. And that's where we can go back to, yeah, you know, it's easy to get caught up in, in things online, the news, but what's really important is our lived experiences, our everyday lives, right? And so it's taking this sort of red herring of crime and instead of trying to talk about why that's not the thing with facts, we shift it back to, and and what are you experiencing? You know, how, how has that impacted you? Some other examples uh, in climate and conversa uh, conservation conversations, um, there's uh, there's often a concern about uh, cost, the cost of renewable energy, electric cars, whatever it may be. There's this there's this big narrative out there again being um, being pushed by you know the powers that be that well we we can't afford more sustainable this or that you know developers are going to pass that cost on to us. And uh, a friend of mine in the in the deep canvassing world said once, and I'll never forget it. He said, I think. Climate justice is really economic justice in disguise. And I was like, yes, because when it comes to the cost of sustainability, the cost of fighting climate change, uh, everyday working people absolutely should not be paying that cost. What's unfair is that, you know, wealthy CEOs and, you know, developers, whoever it may be, are, are not playing fair. So we, we got to a really interesting place with this particular script where we were trying to get to this cost thing, but it's, you know, trying to figure out what are the facts that will show how it's actually less expensive. And then we realized it's not really about the cost. It's about the fact that developers aren't playing fair. And that's, that's a different conversation. That's, that's a valid concern, but it's a different conversation from the, the topic at hand. So when this addressing concern section, it says, you know, if, if voters are concerned about the cost, developers are going to pass those on. It's like, I hear you. At the same time, the cost of installing new gas lines into every new development is already getting passed on to existing gas users. What do you think it would take for developers to play fair? So this is, you know, acknowledging that concern and then shifting the narrative, taking it to a different place that I think is really more at the heart of the emotions that are underlying that concern. Uh, 
you know, going back to addressing concerns being, you know, something that requires a lot of testing unique to your particular situation. Uh, it's also typically ends up as what I call as like an as needed or a la carte format. So as you saw in um, these examples, there's like literally a <laughs> a chart and it's like, if you hear this, respond with this. And we don't expect uh, canvassers to to read through all of that information, all those words. It's a use what you need, kind of choose your own adventure. <laughs> and the placement of this section is particularly important as well. We're not addressing concerns in the introduction. We're not responding to misinformation as folks are sharing their stories. We are building rapport. We're understand, we know where gets no voter stand. We share the stories. After we have done all that, we address the concerns and respond to misinformation. And I've found time after time that, again, you can't deep canvas people out of misinformation, but if you have to do a little bit of education or responding to misinformation, wait until after the story share, wait until you've built that trust and that emotional connection and, and got to those lived personal experiences. And then the few well-placed facts, the education that you do need to do will resonate much more effectively. Uh, here's a bonus. <laughs> so, and when it comes to shifting that narrative and addressing concerns, you know, the, the magic of deep canvassing is that we're giving folks a space to, to become conscious of their cognitive dissonance and process that dissonance. And so sometimes there's this nifty little line in scripts where, you know, we've, we've talked about the issue, we've shared our concerns, we've shared our experiences, and now we're at a place where there's a lot of, we've touched on a lot of stuff in the conversation. And to kind of drive it home for the voter, you can throw in this little line and there's, um, you know, you can, you can, it can be open to whatever the, the particular concerns are related to your issue. But for the example of a, of a, a climate policy, we can say, you know, I hear that you're concerned about, um, you know, the, the grid or increased cost. At the same time, you also express concern about, you know, the, the health and safety of your children and grandchildren. How does it feel to put those concerns side by side? And this is this is pretty pointed. This is this is pretty delicate, but um, in the right context and with the right training, this can be really effective for for driving home that 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 dissonance and and leading to to the outcome that we want. Getting to the end now, making our case. Okay, we've built rapport. We've shared our stories. We've addressed concerns. We've processed some dissonance. Now. Like I said, this is where you get to preach. So this is where you share your key messages, kind of what you want voters to believe, the the goal and and purpose of, of your campaign, of your conversations. You want to reiterate, you know, the main reasons why this issue matters to you and to the voters and to your community. You might want to kind of call out any scare tactics or fear mongering to say like that stuff, that's that's not it, that's not real. You might need to evoke a little sense of urgency, you know, explain the now, why this moment is, is the moment to take action. And strength in numbers always lands really well with folks, you know, talking about the power of community coming together when we, when we come together to use our voices. Again, you know, there's probably messaging best practices out there and research that says, you know, this is the framing that works to talk about this issue. Uh, use that. Um, this, you know, section, again, may require some, some iteration, but no need to, to reinvent the wheel. Here are some examples of a making the case from various scripts. Um, again, going back to this climate script that I've referred to a couple times. The zero carbon step code is specifically about making new buildings more efficient, affordable, and comfortable for people to live in, in the face of the changing climate for our communities. It's true that we can't make the shift to all electric overnight, but this policy is taking the first step to get us there. And we can use our voices as a community to come together and tell city council what we, re what we require the developers to do. What do you think about that? And you'll see most uh, every making the case ends with uh, turning it back to the voter. What do you think about that? Uh, ideally for them to say, yeah, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> You're like, yeah, I agree with that. Or maybe not, but <laughs> best case scenario, it's a, it's a positive response. Another example of a um, kind of complex conservation policy that, that we uh, developed a script on. Uh, this one says, you know, the industry is already changing and it's clear that we can't continue without changing the way that we manage our forests. 
it's time we start thinking long term for our forests and our jobs. And that's why we need a biodiversity and ecosystem health law for BC. And when it comes to getting a new law like this passed, there's strength in numbers. Your voice makes a difference when many of us voters speak together. We have a window of opportunity right now with the new premier, and we need to come together to get our government to defend our best interests. What do you think about that? So there's a little more urgency of the moment there in, in prompting folks to take action in this one. I see there's some questions in the chat, and I will get to those at the as soon as I have gotten through uh, all the script sections here. So in making the case, again, it's your key messages, what you want the voters to believe. It will require some iteration, um, not that you have to be coming up with the words out of nowhere, but like I said, when there's messaging best practices out there, kind of uh, like puzzle pieces, you wanna see what works, see what order works. And then once this section is strong, it is something the canvassers should read word for word. You know, this is the most, I'd say this is the most carefully crafted wording of any script is the making the case and it's almost the last thing you know after right after you're making the case that's when you're like thanks so much for your time before i let you go just one more question and it's the final rating so ideally this is where the voter articulates their shift in beliefs it's the exact same scale questions the initial rating repeat it word for word uh and after you get that rating again you want to ask why is that the right number for you so initially, the first time we ask the scale question, we get an initial rating. We ask, you know, what's on either side of this? Why is that the right number? To understand where the voter stands. At the final rating, we ask, why is that the right number for you? Because this is where the voter is going to say out loud, well, I really think, you know, the, the impacts of climate change are, are too serious uh, not to take action on. Or, well, you know, I, I, I really hope that we can afford this, but at the same time, we can't afford not to, you know, whatever it is for the voter, this is where they're going to say out loud how and why they have been moved. And the act of articulating that really solidifies the movement in their beliefs. So there we go. Articulating the why is huge. And sometimes there isn't movement. You know, this happens often where someone stays at the same number, but generally there's, you can, you can kind of feel when you've made an emotional connection with someone and when they're gonna keep thinking about what you've said. And there is in fact research from previous deep canvassing experiments that shows that in some cases, the impact of a persuasive conversation can grow over time. So maybe in the moment at the end of the conversation, a voter is kind of still processing, they're not quite sure. But if you ask them a week or two later, that, that percolating and processing is gonna have its impact. Just to review basic components of every deep canvassing script. One, the introduction, getting into the conversation, building rapport. Two, the initial rating, know where the voter stands. Then you get into your story sharing, the heart of the conversation. You might need to address some concerns after that, clarify misinformation, start shifting the narrative. You're making the case is where you share your key messages, the big takeaway, and then wrap it up with the final rating where the voter articulates their shift in beliefs. So some of the common challenges, and I think some of these are coming through in the chat, um, maybe you're having low conversation completion rates. So you're, you're on the phones, you're on the doors, and uh, your canvassers are, are talking to folks, but then the, the conversations aren't resulting in you know, a final rating, or uh, the, the conversations are getting cut off, or maybe voters aren't sharing stories then the script isn't effective if you don't have a story exchange. Maybe your canvassers are not using the script. That's a problem. Or maybe, you know, you've got a good script or it feels like a good script, but you're not seeing the movement that you want. And there's really two big things that I think are, are the solution to all of these issues. It's, it's not a silver bullet, but, um, you know, you need to iterate your script. You need to test it, do some trial and error. And invest in training your canvassers. And I, I understand that one of the biggest um, challenges of deep canvassing is that it is a little more resource intensive. It takes a little more time and, and energy to, to get the level of training that you need. Um, but that's what makes it work. And, you know, in almost every in almost every deep canvas experiment that I've been a part of, those those published articles has been with intensely trained teams. There are 
Um, there are programs out there that provide uh, some level of, of free Canvas or training, intensive deep Canvas or training. The Deep Canvas Institute is a project of People's Action and the New Conversation Initiative that provides uh, uh, an intensive deep Canvas 101 series. And I provide training customized to fit your needs, your budget. Um, you know, there, there are options out there for getting folks the training they need. And once they have it, uh, they're not going to lose it, you know, so it really is an investment, especially if you're working on an issue that is is long term or you're trying to to build a movement. Uh, investing in deep canvassing is is going to pay off. I can guarantee that. Um, you know, examples of some of what LM engagement provides, you know, that script iteration, canvas or training, team coaching, program design or whatever kind of consultation you need for your program where it's at. And I'm looking forward to, to hearing from folks and, and having a bit of a conversation here. Thanks so much. All right. I see there's several questions and comments in the chat, and I think <clears throat> our moderators from Call Hub might be taking note of those. Uh, yeah, we are. So there were a couple of questions. So one thing from a little while ago, there was a question, but it was kind of interesting as such. So uh, it was asked like, you know, there are problems, like people have problems that some people are not answering phone calls. So they want to know like, does the same like a logic or outline apply for like conversations at door knocking or at town halls? Like, uh, you know, how do we react to that? Yes, absolutely. So everything I've shared here applies to deep canvas scripts, whether you're on the phones or on the doors, there might be some differences in especially what the introduction looks like, because building rapport over the phone is a lot tougher. Um, but the same principles apply. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, we had another question in which it would like, how long would you expect like this type of call to take on average, I suppose, if you're looking to have like a pretty deep conversation, how long do they normally go on for? Yeah, I mean, generally an effective deep canvas conversation is anywhere from, I'd say, 12 to 20 minutes. Um, it could be 10 minutes, but that's awfully brief. It depends. I mean, if, if you have a fairly short, straightforward script, 10 minutes might be enough. Generally, it's closer to 12 or 15. And, you know, every now and then, uh, especially if a canvasser makes a particular strong connection with a voter, there's going to be a 20 or 25 minute conversation. But that's not not the norm. I'd say keeping it around 12 to 15 is is what you can expect. Oh, OK. Um, OK, another question in terms of like aggression, for example, like it is a divided nation as such. Not everybody is going to be in a very good mood. And like, so like, it, does it, is this like separate training for like aggression or how do you like de-escalate situation or does that not really happen? You mean if the, if the voter, the person on the other side is being aggressive and doesn't want to have the conversation? Yeah, I think yeah. it's, it's hard to give a uh, kind of black and white guidelines, but in order for a conversation to be effective, both parties have to be willing to have a conversation. So if someone is responding in a way that's kind of antagonistic, they're not answering questions, they're trying to take control of the conversation, um, that might not be, you know, you might have to, to leave that conversation because it's not going to be effective. And that's, that's, that's kind of a, that's a tricky part of, of training your canvassers. And it's not something that necessarily shows up in the script, but I'd say, you know, the, the rule of thumb is if you can actually have a conversation, if you can effectively follow the script and share, um, stick with it. If not, if you're spending all of your time as a canvasser just trying to keep someone on track or if you're on the defensive and the conversation, it's not worth it. OK, so it's better to like move on than like just stand on ground there types. Uh, yeah, if, if, if you're not able to have an co effective conversation, don't don't waste your time. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah, so Nancy had a question which says, in part of the script that processes the contradictions, if they come down to the original side, do you go back into the cone of curiosity again? Or uh, is basically, is it like, do you come down more on the side of the issue that you're focusing on? Or do you just continue being like curious about, you know, what they're saying? Like, how do you go on? That's a great question and something that I've come up recently on, on some of the projects I'm working on now. You know, when an issue is complex, you may have to process with the voter a couple of times. At the same time, if that turns into a 25, 30 minute conversation, it's kind of a judgment call of whether 
it's it's worth investing that much to get one person to move. You know, it may be that you go through the script, you're addressing concerns, you're processing, and you're 20, 25 minutes in, and it's a good conversation. But, you know, if you're not able to move that voter in that moment with a single conversation, that's okay. You know, some folks are going to need more time. Maybe they'll need a follow-up conversation. And that's something that a, a lot of campaigns don't necessarily plan for, but I think is uh, is a really great approach if, you know, if over the course of your canvassing, there are folks who don't move, but you have good conversations or folks who it started off good, but the conversation was cut short. Um, put those folks on a list to follow up with and maybe you can go back and, and try again. Okay. Um, another question by uh, Hendrik. He wants to know, like, is it is it better to take like local issues or national issues? I suppose it sounds Easier to just pick some local issue, but what if we want to like uh, go with the national one? Do you have better results on what side it is? That's interesting. I appreciate the question. I see that this is coming from uh, social democratic students in Sweden. Yeah. So my experience working in the U.S. and Canada is that the more local is typically more effective because it's more likely that someone's going to have a personal experience or they're going to be able to relate personally to the issue. However, there are national issues that can affect us very personally. So I'd say I can't say that one is necessarily better, but I'd say if you're if you're debating between a couple different policy um policies or issues, pick the one that you feel like folks are going to be the most personally impacted by. Okay. Uh, yeah, Rachel has a question, like, do you have any tips for differentiating yourself from an online salesperson at the outset and avoid somebody who they don't have the time to like talk or something like that? I mean, they might, actually, it's a fair question. People might think that you have to sell something or. Oh, always. Time, yeah. Oh, always. I mean, and it's honestly, it's to the point where I didn't share it this one, but there's a script where the introduction is. Hi, how are you doing? My name's Laura. I'm with such and such organization. We're not selling anything. We're here to, and you can just say that off the bat, you know, because that 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 suspicion is very common, and folks want to say, "Oh, I'm not selling anything," or you know, you'll see those signs in people's windows that say "No soliciting." And uh, if you're not soliciting, if you're not selling anything, you have every right to be there. And so that also comes in with a bit of canvasser training to give folks the the confidence to say, like, "Hey, we're just we're, we want to have a conversation." <laughs> I mean, the Rachel's question had a second part as well, which I kind of found interesting in the sense that have you tried this for like trade union or workplace campaigns where like people are presumably very divisive already? Like they may not, they usually union campaigns, people are aware. So it's very hard to like change minds as such. But so have you tried in such places? Mm -hmm. I personally have not worked in a trade union or workplace campaign. I would love to. I think that the um, the labor movement has, has a history of really strong organizing, though. And I think uh, most of the folks who have worked in uh, workplace campaigns, um, there's there's a lot of good practices being done already that probably look a lot like deep canvassing. So I haven't seen a specific example of we are using deep canvassing in this you know, union or workplace campaign, but the similar techniques are there. Hmm. Um, I think as a continuation of that, like Donald has a question saying that has is deep canvassing been used in federal elections, which actually I even I was wondering about. Like, what is the scope of like national uh, that election that we're using here? That's I I would love to know. Um, I mean, one of the um, one of the most um, one of the most impactful experiences that I've had in working on a campaign, and one of the um, one of the experiments, one of the strongest experiments that's been done was actually related to the 2020 presidential election in the U.S. So um, there was a script developed uh, by People's Action and their affiliates to persuade folks away from Trump and towards Biden. And I helped develop that script and trained uh, the teams that put it into practice. There were both paid and volunteer teams across the country that used that script. And it, it was effective. And those were really, um, you know, kind of juicy, interesting conversations. I think, you know, that was also an extremely unique presidential election because both the candidates, uh, you know, were so unique in their own ways and, and doing that in the context of, of the pandemic at that time um, was just a really unique situation that I don't think is going to repeat. Although um, who knows what 2024 will bring. I think there is um, huge potential for deep canvassing to play a role in the next presidential election, but I'm not aware of any um, 
I'm not aware of it being a part of a specific campaign strategy yet. Okay. Um, there's a question from Tanvi, like, how do we effectively keep in touch with folks after the door knock is done? Actually, yeah, do we have like some system of follow up or that conversation and that's over? Like, how do you go from there? Oh my gosh, great question. I mean, this really depends on your organization strategy and um, your kind of uh, approach and plan to organizing. You know, a campaign, you know, I think there's there's a Venn diagram of what is community organizing and what is campaigning. Because you can run a really strong campaign, but if it is done at election day and there's no follow up, um, there's not a lot of organizing that's coming out of that versus there's excellent community organizing that's being done year round that's not related to a campaign. And then sometimes the two can overlap. So that intersection, I think, is where there's a lot of potential. Um, you know, if you are running a sort of time bound deep canvas campaign because of funding or whatever that's going to end at a certain date. Uh, make sure you look at, you know, what are your resources and your capacity to do that follow up? How can you bring folks into maybe events programming that is that is uh, already planned outside of that campaign? I think looking at that connection um, is really powerful, but it's going to depend on your organization's you know context and, and resources. OK, uh, as a follow up to that, in the sense that if you look at the kind of levels of advertising and money, speaking of 2020, the, it was the election with the most money ever spent uh, in American history. Uh, in terms of like deep canvassing, okay, it might, in terms of that there is cost involved, but is it better to fold like deep canvassing efforts into campaigns or just run like a low level campaign of deep canvassing like all year round? Like, how do you get faster results as such? Because the campaign I mean, might spend a lot of money. Uh, and so you might be tempted to be like, okay, I'll, I'll you know, hitch my wagon to this, but does it have? Is it better to do it long term or short term? That's the question, right? Um, I mean, I think it, it all depends. It all depends on strategy, strategy and targeting. Um, you know, deep canvassing is not a replacement for get out the vote best practices. You know, deep canvassing is a technique for persuasion. It's a technique for building power, for building movements. And so if there is a if you know that your campaign has a has a tight margin and you might you know need to do some persuasion to, to to cross that line then incorporate deep canvassing specifically with that you know target of folks who are in that persuasion audience right um if if you're able you know if if you look at your campaign from the outset and think that you know standard get out the vote turn out the base is all that you need then it may not be worth it to invest in canvassing but if you if you're going to need some persuasion or on the other end if you're looking at organizing in a community long term where um you are currently maybe in the in the minority on an issue or think you're in the minority on an issue maybe you want to do a, a deep canvassing campaign to identify where your supporters actually are or to see how persuadable your your opponents are you know i think there's a role for deep canvassing short term in a campaign context as well as long term in a in a power building you know movement context uh okay so here's a question by david which i'll tweak a little so David, the direct question is, what do you do if canvassers don't have a compelling personal story? They just think it's a good idea and they just want to help, which is fair enough. But yeah, I this... that as well, like if I could just tweak it in the sense that obviously most canvassers would not, like do you take people only from the local stuff or do you like train them in something that helps them? So what do you do when they don't have a personal story? Yeah, this is a great question. I'm thinking specifically about one of the earlier projects I worked on um, that involved uh, talking about national immigration policy and specifically support for for undocumented immigrants in the u.s and we did we did a couple different things with that one thing we did was if if you truly do not know any you know anyone who's undocumented or any immigrants um we would ask you know how did your family come to this country and the unique thing about the u.s is that um you know, a lot of folks with, especially folks with European heritage, you know, we're, we're not really from here, right? And so in a way we all have an immigration story, it's just maybe not what you think. And so we were able to talk about, um, you know, people's family history and their experiences as immigrants maybe 100, 150 years ago and compare that with, you know, the challenges that people are facing immigrating to this country today. That was one thing that sometimes worked. Another thing was, um, you know, if, thinking about the context where I worked on that campaign in North Carolina, um, there were individuals on our team who maybe coming in said, I don't know, 
oh, I'm not sure who I know who's an immigrant who's an un undocumented. We were like, well, let's let's have a, a, a little get together, a little community meeting at the office. And we'll talk with some of the folks that we know in this community who, who are in fact undocumented, or we would share stories of the folks that we know, our friends and families, um, so that canvassers could then, you know, meet someone who is impacted by this issue directly or sort of uh, borrow another person's personal story. And we found that work, we've, we've found that can work in other contexts as well. If you personally don't have an experience or don't, um, don't know someone close to you maybe it's oh well you know my, my my co-workers partner or you know a friend of my cousin and even though it's you know a little bit removed from yourself if you can tell a compelling emotional personal story from from someone it can it can have the same impact so sort of story borrowing is what we call that oh okay that makes sense uh, it's a question for me, actually, uh, which is the idea is like you started this by saying you did not imagine that you would be into deep canvassing. And honestly, a lot of people who like, for example, who signed up for this session as well, they're considering deep canvassing for the first time. So I was wondering, like, you know, in your own experience, when you perhaps like tried it for the first time, what was it about, you know, when you were deep canvassing that made you believe, OK, you know what, this is going to work as such, because we're all a bit skeptical as such. So oh, how, did, yeah. how do you convert? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, like I said, my background was in environmental education and, and community engagement. So I'd already, you know, I wasn't afraid to talk to strangers. At the same time, I remember the first time I went out on doors, it was in a, a you know, middle class town in, uh, in Pennsylvania. I had been trained on this script, you know, we'd practiced in a, in a training setting and then they're like, all right, go knock on doors. And this was with that, that immigration script that also touched on, on healthcare. And I was thinking like, okay, I'll talk to people, but like, no one's gonna like pour their heart out. You know, these are really personal questions. I don't think people are gonna share their life story with me on the doors. And they did. And it, it, it was shocking and it continues to happen. It continues to surprise me, not every time, but what I learned is that a lot of folks, and this was pre-pandemic, a lot of folks are actually really, eager and 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 sort of humbled in a way to be asked to tell their story you know how often does someone ask you really you know really ask you with genuine curiosity what was that like for you and your family how did that feel and it is unnatural you know it feels it feels awkward as a canvasser but to have the experience on the other side of being asked to to share and reflect on your experiences it, it is actually really valuable and really powerful. And that's something that I do, that we do in trainings is we we deep canvas each other so that we know how it feels on the other side. And, you know, it, again, you know, sometimes folks are having a bad day or don't wanna talk, that's fine. But I'd say like, you know, one in every five conversations I have um, is, is really impactful, you know, for, for me as well. And, uh... Just to get back to what you were saying earlier, you said this is not like a get out and vote sort of thing. So in terms of, but in terms of deep canvassing, I suppose the idea is that you want them to eventually vote in perhaps progressives or whatever the end goal was. If you want to change the policy or to uh, elect the people that you do. So like, can you tell us like how you would specifically say this is very different than like, let's say get out and vote because there are get out and vote campaigns as well, right? Yes. And, you know, I'm glad you asked this because I'm realizing it's one of the, it's one of the challenges that we have in the deep canvassing world is that uh, I can say deep canvassing and, and you know, 10 other folks can hear that and have a sense of what it means. And we'll have 10 different answers of what deep canvassing is. So, and I really, you know, there, there's not a standard textbook definition. Like I said, I think these, it's really about the skills that can be applied in different contexts. I think what it comes down to is, you know, there's there's best practices out there for voter contact for get out the vote. There have been, you know, years and years of research, many camp, you know, thousands of campaigns have done different things over the years. Right. And so we know what works. And especially these days in the U.S., we are also seeing what doesn't work. You know, I live in Ohio and um, we had some 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 great wins this week. At the same time, you know, in recent years, we've seen a lot of campaigns doing what they've always done, using the best practices, and it hasn't worked. So I think deep canvassing has a role to play where 
you know, where there's something that needs to be fixed, right? If the way it's always been done isn't working anymore, we need to try something different. So if it's not broken, don't fix it, right? If your best practices are getting you to win, you're having success, cool, do what you're doing. But if you're finding that the same strategies that you've tried before, the same techniques that you've tried in the past aren't working, maybe it's time to try deep canvassing. <laughs> yeah, that would. All right, uh, Hendrik from Sweden has another question, which is kind of nice. Uh, he says that when they engage students at their doorstep, the students occasionally divert their attention towards different matters than the ones that they're hoping to discuss. So they may agree with the topic itself, like they may agree with the labor movement, but they often prefer to shift the conversation to another issue to avoid appearing to change their position. So, you know, any, uh, any hints for that? That's very interesting. And I think that makes me want to ask some more questions about, um, you know, why are you focused particularly on the student population? You know, what is the change you want to see? And why then are you choosing to focus on issues that maybe aren't top of mind for your target audience? Is it that the issues that you feel are most important or can have the most impact on that population, um, maybe students feel that those aren't the issues that are relevant to their lives. And so maybe it's a matter of finding the stories that make that issue relevant, you know, like climate change. You can, if you say climate change, folks are gonna talk about all kinds of things, but then we found a way to bring this, <laughs> to take the, the distractions and bring it into something that's personal, right? Or maybe, maybe you wanna try changing to talk about one of those different topics that is um, more, more top of mind or, or you know what what your audience is is focusing on. I'd I'd have to to learn more about the the context that you're working in, but it's it's a good question. I think it's really about your kind of um, organizational strategy and the goals that you have long term. Speaking of students, like I don't know Gen Z to like boomers who are who are more easily ready to have longer conversations. Is it that Gen Z people are like, oh, WhatsApp, I don't want to talk about it. Boomers talk a lot. Like, you know, where do the stereotypes lie? That's a great question. I really don't think there's, I really don't think I've seen a consistent trend in in how conversation, how, how folks from different generations are willing to have conversations. Because on the one hand, um, I find that especially on the phones, uh, older folks, there are some older folks who maybe are more accustomed to talking on the phone, or maybe they're lonely. Um, older folks often will will talk ear off. You know, they're 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 way down to have a conversation. Um, versus, but but not always. You know, it depends on the person. And then younger people, I find, uh, you know, there's there's this aspect as well as of. Um, what identities you're bringing as a canvasser, I am a younger person. And so if I knock on someone's door and they're, you know, uh, they're 30, 40 years older than me, maybe they don't want to give me the time of the day because they're like, oh, you young people, you know, I don't care. Um, versus if I knock on the door of someone my age, they're like, hey, you, what, what's going on here? So I, you know, there's a lot of factors. I can't say that there's a significant trend in folks of different ages being more or less willing to have a conversation. It really depends on the people. Uh, to like add to that, like Miranda Bakshir wanted to find out like whether they should have different scripts for senior students and families, or is it the same script works for everybody? The skills are the same. Um, that's a great question. I think you know, I'm thinking about the teams that I've worked with, diverse in terms of age, gender, education, background. Um, the skills are the same. I think what you'll find is that people apply the skills differently. They have different strengths or challenges depending on the identities that they bring. And so, you know, for a specific example, um, you know, depending on, uh, I'm trying to think how, age plays a factor. I guess like what I just said, you know, I can't say that as a younger person, I have more or less success as a canvasser. I do think I have more success with people who are closer to my age. So, you know, if you're looking at a, if, if your target population is of a certain age, maybe you want to focus on canvassers who are also in that age group. Um, but it doesn't, it, it's not like the conversations are different. That's just a matter of, you know, how people are going to react to, to a stranger. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, so you will not make like four different scripts for four different ages. Then. Just no, like, no, the script is the same. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Um, okay, we're almost just about out of, out of time here. <laughs> and I'll see another question as well. So we can probably uh, wrap it up here. Uh, thank you a lot, LM, for sharing your expertise. It was actually quite uh, engaging. I'd not even considered a lot of the aspects that you had mentioned about deep canvassing. So very nice. Thank you so much. Uh, for everybody else here, by the way, you will be receiving a recording of this uh, session on, on your mailboxes. You can get in touch with us as well uh, at marketing at callup.io, and we will help you with that. And thank you so much, LM. And we hope you guys have a good day there. Thanks so much. I dropped my email address there in the chat and you can find me on LinkedIn or online. Happy to continue the conversation with anyone who wants to. Yes, they should. All right. Thank you. See you guys. Thank Bye. You. Bye.